There are many what-ifs regarding early 20th century European history. One of my favorites regards a little-known tank design from 1911 that could have quite possibly changed the course of the world had it been adopted by the Austrian and German militaries three years before the First World War even began. Gunther Burstein was born on July 6, 1879, in Steiermark, a state in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He would join the Pioneer School in Hainburg at the age of 16 in 1895, graduating four years later and joining the Imperial Railway Regiment, the KK Eisenbahn Regiment. He was promoted to Leutnant in 1899. Stationed around the harbor of Pola in 1903, he was invited by his Marine officer cousin to join him on a torpedo boat trip. Impressed by the vessel's high speeds, Gunther came up with an idea for a land torpedo boat, a craft that could assault defensive positions on land in the same manner a torpedo boat could take on battleships in the water. His initial notes put down the requirements of good armor, off-road ability, and the capability to cross over defensive works such as trenches. The idea would mostly fade to the back of his mind until 1906, when he visited the 6th National Automotive Ex Exhibition in Vienna and saw the brand new austro Panzer Panzermobile, which had begun its development in 1904. It was one of the first armored cars ever produced, and Gunther immediately realized the potential for the four-wheeled armored vehicle, a craft that was similar to his own idea three years previously. Not too fond of its four-wheel design, he saw it as a major limiting factor for off-road ability, he began trying to figure out a way such a vehicle could overcome such a limitation. Later that year, he was stationed in Trento. During his time there, he would watch the large artillery pieces get moved around unfavorable terrain, utilizing plate chains, in order to reduce ground pressure. Applying this logic to his idea, he created something he called the Gleitbande, a long plate chain that wrapped around several wheels. Completely unaware that this very system was already invented and in production on tractors built by the Holt Company in the United States, and had already been patented in Austria in 1911, the same year he would submit his own patent for his vehicle. He called it the Motorgeschütz, or motorized gun, the same term that had been occasionally used to describe the austro Daimler Panzermobile, and it's likely that's where he obtained the idea for the name from. It is difficult to describe the exact details of what the Motorgeschütz's capabilities would have been. One of the most noticeable things about it were the arms that extended from the back and the front that could be used to push the tank over trenches and other obstacles. The overall design was box-like, with a 300-degree rotating turret that would have most likely been fitted with a 3.4-centimeter gun. The turret would house two individuals as the tank's gunner and commander. They would also have access to two machine guns, which could be fired through the turret's many vision ports. The third crew member sat in the rear. The third crew member sat in the rear compartment and would handle driving the vehicle and passing ammunition up to the turret for loading. The plans had the engine at the back of the tank. Burstein having envisioned utilizing an already existing 60 horsepower truck engine. He estimated that, with the power of the engine and weight of the tank, it should reach speeds of up to 20 to 30 kilometers per hour on roads, or 12 to 18 miles per hour, 5 to 8 kilometers per hour off-road, or 3 to 5 miles per hour, and 3 kilometers per hour while overtaking obstacles, or just below 2 miles per hour. Disregarding the length of the arms, the tank would have been 3.5 meters long, or 11 and a half feet with the width and height being 1.9 meters, 6.2 feet. The turret would have a diameter of 1.3 meters, 4.25 feet. Its armor would be rather thin, 8 millimeters on the front, 4 millimeters on the sides and rear, and 3 millimeters on the top. Aware this would not protect it from artillery, he figured the tank would easily be able to take out the artillery with its gun before it posed a real threat. The arms were the most unique aspect of the design. Each would have a wheel at the end, helping to keep it from getting stuck in the mud as it traversed over obstacles such as trenches. They could not be operated centrally, and instead the rear arms would be operated by the driver, with the forearms being operated by the crew in the turret. The question remains as to whether or not the arms would do what they were intended for, as all of the ground pressure would be transferred from the tank onto the thin arms in only a small portion of the track which could easily result in the tank getting stuck in muddy terrain. 
so it's likely that if it went into production, the arms would have been removed once such shortcomings were realized. He would submit his design and scale models in October 1911, and received a response three months later in January. The project in question is not suitable to form the subject of a trial at the expense of the Army administration. It is therefore requested to inform the proponent that the realization of his project cannot be done at the expense of the Army administration. The military had no faith in the project, and didn't want to waste funds building a single prototype especially as they simply saw it as another copy of the armored car, a platform the Austrian military had rejected after the unveiling of the Panzermobile in 1906. Not giving up, Burstein went to Germany. However, even there the German war ministry rejected his idea. With no private funds to make his own prototype, he wrote an article for the military newspaper of Streffler in 1912, and received praise for his invention including an endorsement from German Major Blumer. However, nothing more came of it, and no support ever reached him for his idea. While the outdated thinking of the German and Austrian war ministries is often blamed, Burstein's plans were rather vague for a vehicle of that cost. There were very few details, only short patents, and not much else. There wasn't even a proper explanation of how the arms would be powered, by the time his patent had been submitted, most of the functions of his tank had already been patented, such as the tracked system, so he was left with only being able to patent the rather useless arms, and watch as, I, and watch as his idea faded away until the First World War. While he did consider bringing his idea to the Austrian War Ministry when war broke out in July, he decided against it, not wanting to deal with the same rejection all over again. After the war, he stayed within the Austrian military until his retirement in 1934. In 1937, Burstein spoke of his invention and the outcome of the war. It is not difficult to imagine how bitter it was for me when, in the field, I heard the news of the first appearance of the new weapon I had first invented, and later, when the successes of the combat vehicles became greater and greater until they decided the outcome of the war. Every inventor must anticipate the rejection of his designs. That is the bitter fate of inventors. But the fact that the rejection of a viable design had such terrible consequences for the entire nation is probably unique in the history of inventions. Burstein would go on to join the several fascist movements of Central Europe during the time, eventually joining the Nazi party after the annexation of Austria, working with the German military and their tanks before and during the war. One of his most successful inventions being a tank ferry, which he presented personally to Hitler. It got him the War Merit Cross, awarded to him by Heinz Guderian, who was an enthusiastic supporter of Burstein. In 1944, the Vienna Technical University awarded him an honorary doctorate. Due to his own health failing and his wife remaining ill, he was unable to flee as the Soviets advanced in 1945. He opted to kill himself on the 15th of April at the age of 64. It's hard to say just how different the war would have gone if Austria and even Germany had the Motorgeschütz at their disposal in 1914, or even 1915 if he had resubmitted the design upon the start of the conflict. As growing pains and improper use could have negated the possible advantages, while the Entente may have begun development of their own tanks much sooner and without their own growing pains, had the Motorgeschütz been on the field from day one. There is one full-size model that exists at the Austrian Museum of Military History. It is a great showcase of what it would have been like had one been fully built and in combat. Thank you all for watching this video. It's a bit of a break from the aviation history videos. Uh, a friend of mine actually recommended to look into World War One tanks, and I couldn't think of a better example to kind of start the series than with the Motorgeschütz. So I believe that I'm going to be changing from aviation history to that of of military vehicles in general uh, from be right before, during, and right after the First World War. If you guys enjoyed the video, please leave a like, uh, subscribe if you haven't already, and leave a comment with your thoughts. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.